Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the great pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. Good to be back with you. I'm back home in New Jersey for the rest of the summer, I guess. I see a, a familiar background to you this week, Matt. It's good to good to see you're back in your own home, but I hope you had a good time in Saratoga. And Saratoga is what we're going to be talking about, of course, this week. This is a race we've been waiting for for a while, Matt, and uh, no disappointment with the... Um, uh, with the field for the Travers, we got the ones we wanted, I guess. Seven horses, but I'll tell you what, Matt, uh, I could make a case, you could make a case, we could make a case for all seven of these horses. Even the long shots look pretty good to me in here. A nice seven-horse field for the $1.25 million Travers stakes. Yeah, Brian, we got the big four, uh, the big four uh, that we've been talking about for quite a while. It's unusual when you wait for four really important horses like that to show up in a race, and then they all do. Um, of course, that's the three winners of the Triple Crown races in the Travers for the first time since 2017. And uh, along with Archangelo, and mage and national treasure we've got the two-year-old champion forte yeah well it 2017 six years ago all three triple crown winners were in the race but none of them won matt the winner of course was west coast trained by bob dopper and west coast beat them all it wasn't a big surprise that west coast beat them all and uh, it would not be a surprise if none of the triple crown race winners but all three of them are beaten here in the Travers. Let's start from the rail out, Matt. Uh, it's a good place to start because drawn the rail is the morning line favorite, seven to five morning line favorite. I rad Ortiz Jr. in the saddle for Forte. As you mentioned, the two-year-old champion, there he is. Son of Violence has done little wrong as a three-year-old. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. The the you know the the only thing that he did wrong was uh, finishing second in the Belmont Stakes off of that prolonged layoff, that ten week layoff that happened uh, when he had the minor ailment that that took him out of the Kentucky Derby and took him out of the Preakness and and came back and I thought ran uh, ran a nice race in the Belmont Stakes, but then got back to the winner's circle in the uh, you know, sort of controversial stretch run of the Jim Dandy. Right. And as a two-year-old, Matt, Forte was kind of showing his dominance at the end of the year, winning uh, races nicely. Uh, well, I guess I'm really talking about that Breeders' Cup Juvenile last fall at Keeneland, where he won impressively. Uh, Forte, lately, it's been a little bit tougher for him. Uh, even going back to the Florida Derby, he had to work hard late to roll by Mage, the Kentucky Derby winner, as it turned out. Uh, Forte, as you mentioned, was second, and he had to work hard to get by his stablemate, Tapit Trice, to be second. Although I think Archangelo was helped by a uh, opening on the rail that day at Belmont, but it was a good race for Forte. And then last time in the gym, Dandy at Saratoga, track now where he's won a couple of graded stakes, he had to work hard to win that gym, Dandy. Uh, great record. Seven wins, a second in the Belmont, nine career races. Like I said, did a little wrong this year, did a little wrong last year, certainly, as an Eclipse Award winner. But uh, maybe life's been a little bit tougher for Forte. Probably a pretty good favorite here. Um, do we think he's beatable as the favorite in the Travers? Well, yeah, certainly you have to think that, as you mentioned in the lead-in, that there are several horses that have very good credentials and, and on the top of their game, you know, are are, are formidable contenders. So uh, Forte has to face that, of course, uh, uh, going into the Jim Dandy. Todd Pletcher added blinkers for the first time on Forte and, and – uh, after the after that race, and and he is still saying that uh, in in morning workouts that the blinkers have made a significant difference in Forte in keeping him focused uh, for the entirety of either the workout or a race, as was the case in the Jim Dan. Yeah, his connections are certainly saying the right things. Todd Pletcher, Mike Rapoli, um, blinkers on, as you said last time, and he's drawn the rail this time. I think that's an interesting combination. 
as he goes into a, a mile and a quarter race here. Granted, it's not a big field, seven horses, but on the other hand, uh, there are six good horses outside him. There's a little bit more speed outside him. Not a lot of speed, but a little bit more speed. So it'll be interesting to see what a blinkered Forte does from that rail draw uh, here in the Chargers on Saturday clearly going to be favored but uh, i think the second choice is this guy there's our cover boy matt archangelo you can see uh uh a, a nice picture there with his uh, trainer looking on and archangelo is a big strong gray son of arrogate matt who looked good winning his fifth lifetime race that happened to be the belmont stakes as i said he did get a hole uh, on the inside that he took full advantage of with javier castellano uh, it's a good point to mention Javier Castellano, of course, because he won two thirds of the uh, Triple Crown this year with Mage in the Derby, Archangelo in the Belmont. He had the choice to make which one he would uh, ride in the Travers because they'd never faced each other before. And uh, he chose Archangelo. Interesting. Jockeys can be right, jockeys can be wrong, Matt. What do you think? Was he right in choosing Archangelo over Mage here in the Travers? Well, we'll certainly find that out, Brian. I mean, I think the circumstances involved in the, in the choice may have been that Archangelo is a you know is more of a New York based uh, 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 horse. Um, I, I think Castellano is a little bit uh, has a bit of a relationship professional uh, with uh, trainer Jenna Antonucci. Uh, Castellano has ridden. Uh, uh, Archangelo in his last three races and won all of all of those. So I guess there's some momentum and such uh, and a little more familiar familiarity and he's gotten to see maturity in Archangelo over the uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, couple months since the Belmont Stakes. I, I think it is a significant, a uh, choice by a rider because we're talking about Javier Castellano, who is the who has won the Traverse Stakes uh, uh, six times, I think. At this point, uh, um, he's won races with a heavy favorite, an odds-on favorite, and Bernardini, and he's won races with long shots, nineteen to one. And remember, back in 2015, he rode uh, Keen Ice. At sixteen to one to defeat American Pharaoh. Yeah, it is a big decision that Castellano made. Not only because he's a successful rider over the years, successful in the Travers, as you stated, Matt, uh, but also two of the principals in here. And we're talking about the Kentucky Derby winner and the Belmont Stakes winner. So a uh, big decision made by Castellano. Uh, we talked a lot about Forte having ten weeks off. You know, part of that was, well, he missed the Derby. He missed the Preakness with the foot boost. But we talked about 10 weeks going from the Florida Derby all the way to the Belmont. And we weren't sure if Forte would be at his absolute best after that layoff. Why are we talking about Archangelo? Uh, this is 11 weeks. He hasn't run since winning that Belmont Stakes, which was a big step up uh, in, in distance to a mile and a half in class. He, he won the one turn. Uh, Peter Pan before, but now 11 weeks off since that big win. Matt, I, I'll, I'll say this. When I'm looking at layoffs, sometimes, you know, a trainer plays a big part of it. And um, I don't really know too much about Jenna Antonucci off a layoff with big horses because, of course, this is her biggest horse ever. But uh, I, I do sometimes favor horses that have a little bit more early speed off the layoff than horses who are more lumbering types big, strong horses who like to rally. I, I don't know if that's true for you as well. Well, I certainly did take note of the fact that uh, Archangelo hasn't run since the Belmont Stakes in my uh, Travers uh, uh, post-draw rundown that's up on Horse Racing Nation. And and in, in answer to your question or, or earlier, maybe we're not talking about the layoff because it was a decision that Antonucci made pretty quickly after the Belmont stakes, as opposed to what happened with Forte when uh, it was not a decision that uh, uh, Pletcher wanted to make. That's a good point, Matt, but still I wonder if 11 weeks coming out of a mile and a half Belmont uh, is, are we going to see the, the, the absolute best from Archangelo? I'm not quite sure. We'll see 
Moving on, number three, Tapich Rice. Matt, Tapich Rice, of course, has been much talked about all year. He's the other Pletcher in here. Jose Ortiz, the other Ortiz riding. Uh, pretty big odds. You've never seen 12 to 1 type of morning line on Tapich Rice before. But after winning two graded stakes on the Kentucky Derby Trail and going to Kentucky as one of the favorites, he's sandwiched out of the money performances in the Kentucky Derby and the Haskell. Uh, the, the, the middle of that sandwich was the Belmont Stakes where he ran a good third. But he's been a little disappointing, especially in two of those last three races. Yeah, agreed. I think you can't argue with that. Uh, uh, the, the most recent races, uh, particularly uh, the performance in the Haskell, have been disappointing. And the response from uh, Todd Pletcher has been to put blinkers on Tapit Trice. Kind of going, I guess, with the... Uh, uh, put blinkers on strategy of Forte, trying to get Tapit Trice to be more focused. He seemed he's a horse that has kind of gotten out of the gate slowly and, and and not seemed to be interested in what has been going on in the early going. So Pletcher puts the blinkers on. We'll see if it makes a difference. Um, this is certainly a tough field for Tapit Trice. It's a tough field for everybody, uh, for all these three-year-olds uh, uh, in the in the Travers. Um, certainly, the the mile and a quarter distance probably shouldn't be a factor. Uh, we saw him run well in the Belmont Stakes. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm not uh, against Tapit Trace on the ten furlongs. I'm a little bit against him from his recent form, and maybe he's proving that he's not quite as good as the best in this division. We'll see. I can't throw him out. As I said about all seven horses in this race, you can make a case for it. Blinkers on is interesting. I've also heard Pletcher talk about in both the Derby and the uh, uh, Haskell, he was kind of uh, in between horses, and he wasn't free to run, and it kind of uh, got him out of his best running. Uh, he he didn't uh, he he probably wants to be in a position where he can sweep by horses a little bit more on the outside and 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 that might be tough with the three hole here out of the seven I guess he's one of the most likely unlikely winners in the race Matt but again a horse you can't completely throw out number four is Mage number four is the Kentucky Derby winner Mage you'll see has Louis Saez uh, that that's not such bad news because Louis Saez has won on Mage before, and Louis Saez has won the Travers before. So uh, Mage is not uh, uh, picking up a new rider or a rider who hasn't had big success at Saratoga. Um, two losses since the Kentucky Derby, and, and we've seen over the last decade or more where Kentucky Derby winners just have not fared so well after the Kentucky Derby. But I'll say to you, Matt, I, I really don't mind his two losses so much. I think both come with an excuse, and in both races, he ran reasonably well. Yeah, I agree with that, but I, I, I don't think I have quite the same sentiment about those performances as you do, uh, Brian. You know, in the Haskell, the trainer and the connections were, were right up front. They were pre-excusing the performance of Mage uh, in the Haskell in that he uh, uh, was coming off a layoff and, and and felt he wasn't at 100%, ran a good second place. Uh, to me, the Preakness performance is a little bit more of a concern when he, uh, when he finished third uh, in what was certainly not a very strong Preakness field. No, it wasn't a strong Preakness field, but it was also nearly 114 uh, six furlong split in that Preakness, and I, I don't think that would set it up for any horse who wants to come from off the pace. So that's the uh, post excuse, if you will, for Mage in the Preakness. Uh, third in the Preakness, second in the Haskell. I kind of like the way, Matt, that he made a big uh, run in the Haskell, kind of like he did in the Florida Derby, which prepped him for a Kentucky Derby win on a mile and a quarter. Did a, a similar run in, in in the Haskell against, I think, probably a very good horse, uh, Go Rocket Ride, and maybe a track that's not as easy to rally as some at Monmouth Park. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of liking the way Mage is now coming up to the Travers here as opposed to maybe the Haskell or the Paceless Preakness where he came back quick. All right, number five, the last Triple Crown race winner we're going to talk about in the, in the Travers here, Matt, National Treasure. Um, he has the most speed in the race. He's only won uh, uh, 
two out of, I, I want to say, seven or eight starts. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but it seems like he's been in a lot of great stakes where he's been good, not great. The Belmont, he set the pace for a while, but never really looked strong as soon as they turned for home and faded to sixth. It wasn't a terrible effort, but uh, 10 furlongs now. In the Belmont, National Treasure was coming off pretty short rest, having won the Preakness. Now he goes back to Southern California, and he's working very well at Del Mar. Bob Baffert, Johnny Velasquez on a speed horse in a race where there's no other clear speed horse. Right, Brian. But as you said, this we're, we're talking about a uh, uh, mile and a quarter in uh, Travers. Uh, um, he, as I mentioned about the Preakness field before, uh, got the victory in a uh, uh, a very weak uh, Preakness field. Um, before that, uh, his performances out in California on the Kentucky Derby Trail were not particularly noteworthy with and now he's got just two victories in his career blinkers come off for uh national treasure in the travers and that's a little bit of a head scratcher for me that's a like uh i i am not sure does baffert think that's going to help him uh preserve his speed more uh in this uh, classic distance. I'm not sure, but uh, for me, that's not a good sign. Yeah, and for me, that's not a bad sign, Matt. Um, it, it, Baffert's won so many big races the last 30 years that you got to trust that he has uh, something in mind with this horse or seen something in the mornings. He's certainly working well in California. The Belmont, again, was off pretty short rest off that Preakness win. Yeah, the Preakness was a slow pace and he controlled it. But uh, I tell you what, I, I think there's a chance that he can control this pace to some level. I, I think there will be uh, horses knocking on the door uh, more with more intensity than they did in the Preakness. But the fact that he is a layoff now working well, um, blinkers off might just mean he sees the horse that uh, Baffert wants to battle uh, uh, out, out battle to the wire when he when he comes up to National Treasure. I, I think National Treasure is a dangerous presence. He is the un, uh, he's the horse we're not really talking about among the Triple Crown race winners, but I think he's a danger, dangerous presence. And I, I don't know of a better American rider than Johnny Velasquez on a horse to dole out the fractions and uh, be strong with a speed horse coming down the lane. Number six, Disarm. Uh, Disarm, like National Treasure, I think he's only two wins out of eight lifetime starts as well. Uh, he's run well at Saratoga. Joel Rosario, Steve Asmussen, great connections. Um, the, the Jim Dandy certainly wasn't a bad race. Uh, I, I, a little bit like Tappet Trice here. I, I'm just thinking I like some others better. But on the other hand, there, there's a lot to like about Disarm. And he seems like, this Sonic Gunrunner, seems like a horse who will eventually break, three and, break through and win something pretty big. I don't know if it's Saturday, but uh, another horse you got to consider at least. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way about eventually uh, Disarm is going to find the right spots and and win some big races, which is the way of uh, Steve Asmussen developing older horses. And I think Asmussen has said the has said the same thing himself that that he feels like there's a big one in Disarm. Um, and thus, uh, he is putting the blinkers on disarm. Um, he said at the draw that he was doing that because, frankly, he was uh, he was disappointed with the performance of disarm uh, in the Jim Dandy. And I guess, you know, I have that feeling about liking him uh, uh, going down the road because there's that fourth place finish in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, fourth in the Kentucky Derby was a good performance. Behind Mage, behind Two Phils, behind Angel of Empire. Uh, fourth in the Jim Dandy may not have been such a good performance, but on the other hand, he was just beaten over two lengths. Uh, if he can, if he can step forward in the race that they were pointing for, with the addition uh, of equipment on and, and uh, prepping for a mile and a quarter race, which should suit him that distance. Again, disarm another horse you can't throw out. And finally, last but not least, and really for me, last but not least, because I think Scotland is a real wild card in here, Matt. Um, Bill Mott, late developing horse. That sounds familiar over the last 
oh, four decades or more, we've been watching horse racing. Scotland, uh, Sonic Good Magic, coming off a really nice win over the track. I, I don't know what this means, but in his last two races, he beat the two horses who ran one, two in yesterday's uh, Smarty Jones stakes at Parks. You, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not saying that Il Miracola and Cagliostro are world beaters, but uh, he has run against some good horses as he steps up big time in class here now in the grade one drivers. But developing, getting better, has a little bit of tactical speed, has a nice win over the track. There's a lot to think about here with possibly the longest shot on the board. Yeah, uh, certainly. Uh, uh... The things that you describe uh, point out a horse that has a future. Again, um, it may not be in this tough field in the Travers, but uh, certainly a horse that's getting better with the allowance win and then a win in the restricted Curlin Stakes at uh, Saratoga. Interestingly, Brian, uh, Bill Mott, who's won almost every big race, has never won the Travers. Yeah, the Travers never seems to be on his birthday. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> that's something that Philmont, of course, is famous for doing well at Saratoga every year. Scotland, uh, yeah, I, I like the way that in all four of his races, he's run really well, and he looks like he's getting better with every start. Dare I say he's looking a little bit like Archangelo before the Belmont. Scotland is a horse I can just not throw out in the Travers mount. So that's seven, a good seven for the Travers. Let's just talk about the Eclipse Award really quick. Uh, I've seen some articles saying that the winner of the Travers will be the three-year-old champion. You know, that that really comes down to the Breeders' Cup Classic. But on the other hand, I can't completely disagree with that sentiment because I think, again, looking at this field, if Forte wins the Travers, I certainly think he's the leader of the division. Uh, Archangelo, Mage, and National Treasure even would have a uh, – a good leg up, at least, if they won the Travers, because I think people are looking at this Travers as a fourth leg of the Triple Crown, especially this year, Matt. It, it, it's it's become an, a real important race besides the grade one at Saratoga, 1.25 million. It's becoming a real important race this year, deciding who the best three-year-old in the country is. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, they, they have similar resumes, uh, particularly the three from the uh, – uh, from the Triple Crown, um, I think, as you mentioned with Forte, his, uh, you know, his resume is a little bit more extensive. And and if, and I know you're not supposed to think about the, uh, the year before when you're uh, deciding uh, uh, Eclipse Awards and such, but, you know, I, I think that happens. Uh, and uh, if Forte gets the win, he will certainly be way on top in the, division rankings and then you know there's always the chance if uh one of the, the travers winner could go on uh and run in the breeders cup classic and uh, uh a good performance in that race not necessarily winning but a good performance in that race would uh would add to the division credentials yeah here, here's what i'll say about the the top four the other three of course would need to do more than a travers win but the top four they become the division leader, and, and I think that that's clear. Even National Treasure, who has yeah. the uh, least amount of credentials this year, I think if he can come up with Preakness and then a Travers win, I think National Treasure is the division leader. Go Rocket Ride certainly would have something to say about that, maybe a few others, or one of the horses he beats in the Travers in the fall, especially the Breeders' Cup Classic. But uh, right now, any one of those four win, it could be enough to win the Eclipse Award if nobody else does something big after the Travers. I guess that's what we're we're saying here, Matt. All right, we spent a lot of uh, time on the big, big race, uh, Travers, on Saturday at Saratoga. Big card, too. A lot of big horses running in grade one races throughout the Travers card. That'll be drawn later today. We do know Friday, though, that the big race, the grade one personal ensign, this is the race that uh, uh, used to be a mile and a quarter. Now it's a mile and eighth. Has drawn a field of six. Again, not a big field in Saratoga, but we got the horses that we wanted in here, Matt. Looking at the outside, there it is. Nest and Clarier, round three. Clarier beat Nest. Neither won the Breeders' Cup distaff uh, last year, but Clarier was clearly ahead of Nest. Nest got her revenge last time in the shoot B. 
Yeah, absolutely, Brian. We were you know, hoping for that rematch of Nest and Clarier, and, and we've got that. They're right next to each other uh, on the, in the two outside posts in the field. Uh, so uh, um, we'll see. Uh, Secret Oath uh, is in the race again. Uh, Lucas is saying that Secret Oath is uh, uh, back in uh, – form and will be more competitive in the personal ensign than she was in the Ogden Phipps. Yeah, well, yeah, she, she, she'll have to be because she ran a bad race in the Ogden Phipps, although that was her only bad race in, in a yeah. while now. It, uh, you can't like the fact the way Nest handled Secret Oath so easily last summer at Saratoga in both the coaching club American Oaks and the Alabama. But Secret Oath, yeah, Secret Oath is a, is a, is a wild card in here because on her best, she can run with these. And now that she's had a serious layoff between the Belmont Stakes State, Ogden Phipps, and the personal ensign, maybe Secret Oath, maybe Lucas is right. Uh, he said it before with her, and we'll see. But uh, the Kentucky Oaks winner, four-time stakes winner, she can't be ignored. Nor can idiomatic Matt, idiomatic on the rail, Brad Cox, Laurent Giroux. Um, if we're going to take a quick look at this time form U.S. pace projector, uh, there's not a lot of speed in this race, um, maybe even less than the Travers, this nine furlong race. It says Idiomatic is the one that will set the pace. Of the favorites, uh, I think Nest has more speed than Clarier, but uh, Idiomatic coming off a couple straight graded six wins. She's been very good now as a four-year-old for trainer Brad Cox. Yeah, and, and up on the top there when the – the pace projector says favors horses on or near the lead. It's their way saying, it's their way of saying that it looks like a relatively slow uh, uh, pace in there. And yeah, uh, idiomatic Brad Cox uh, won the Delaware handicap last time. Um, and the Sewanee at uh, Churchill Downs before that with basically front end efforts. And you got to think, uh, breaking from the rail that they are going to go to the lead uh, as I guess close to the loan speed and, and should be able to settle out there. But uh, uh, idiomatic hasn't faced like the kind of competition grade one legitimate grade one competition like nest and Clarier. Yeah. I'm glad you said it, Matt. Nest and Clarier, uh, female dirt horses in the country, at least going two turns, Nest and Clarier, because I don't see anything in the three-year-old Philly division that really can compete with Nest or Clarier. Uh, their manner has been good lately in California, but I, I'm not confident that she stacks up to Nest and Clarier. So this race is about Nest and Clarier. Idiomatic is the horse they might have to run down. Secret Oath is a dangerous horse who can run Really good on times. Malloy is much, much, much cheaper. Let's just coming off a fast win at Hawthorne Park. 63 caliber is a nice horse who's got a win over the track, but probably more the grade three type than the grade one type. So let's talk more about Nest and Clarier. Uh, Clarier was coming off two nice grade one wins coming into that UV, but Nest beat her pretty easily that day. Yeah, uh, um, and I don't know if the pace scenario in the personal ensign uh, reminds me of what happened uh, in the Shoe V. Uh, Clarier got uh, uh, got just a little bit too far behind, and Nest got it on the lead and was comfortable. I don't know, Brian. It sure looks like Nest uh, came back after that long layoff uh, better than ever, and and if in fact she's better than ever. That's going to make her very hard to beat under any circumstances. Yeah, any circumstances, especially at Saratoga, because Nest's three races at Saratoga, two last summer, one this year, have been huge. And it makes me think that she's the best female horse in the country at any distance, at any surface. Nest looked that good. But it's only one race this year, so she has to validate that performance, and she has to validate that performance against the best. Nest um failed last year in the breeders cup at keeneland uh, you know she was she had a shot at the head of the stretch but she just kind of uh coasted into fourth last year so not a great performance in the breeders cup this time so there still is a question or two about nest against the very very best and clarier fits that bill um clarier has in time in her career matt shown more speed but it seems like she's really best 
when she can come from behind and rally. So I think Nest also has the tactical advantage that you were talking a little bit about here in the personal ensign. But for me, kind of boils down to Nest seems to really, really love this uh, uh, surroundings and the surface at Saratoga. And uh, we'll see if she can uh, reproduce that Shuby effort. And she's probably a winner if she does. All right, Matt, time for top picks. We talked Travers, we talked personal ensign. Some of the best horses in America running at Saratoga on Friday and Saturday. Let's get to top picks. You're first, and we'll start. Oh, let's start with the girls. Okay, Brian, absolutely. I got to go with, uh, uh, you know, with the, with the posters that I saw at Saratoga, with the chance Nest is the best. I got to go with Nest in Saratoga. Nest is the best. Nest is the best at Saratoga. I uh, wouldn't be shocked if Clarier or even Idiomatic or Secret Oath beat her here, but uh, hard to go against Nest. Unfortunately, she'll be a clear favorite this time. In, oh, that says the Alabama. That, of course, should say the personal ensign. Nest is a uh, uh, top pick for both of us there. Let's go to the boys, Matt. And, well, there it is. If you're watching and not listening, you can see neither Matt and I are on Forte in the Trappers. Hey, Brian, I firmly believe that Forte is the horse to beat. And, and I guess uh, 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 the only thing that that made me not pick Forte was the morning line odds of seven to five. And I believe that that is, uh, is an accurate morning line that Forte is going to be a heavy favorite. He may, he may win this race impressively uh, 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 to back up those odds. Um, but I'm going to go with uh, Archangelo. Uh, um, I, I, you know, am uh, influenced by the decision of Javier Castellano, uh, who waited a, a, a good while to make that decision, and and having gotten to get on the back of Archangelo in a lot of his workouts and and seeing his workouts this summer at Saratoga. I think he's seeing a horse that he thinks can win this race. Yeah, and and I, I can't argue with that, and I can't argue with his decision. And we've talked about a few things why he made his decision, including Archangelo's continued development, what a big, strong horse he is, and how well he's looked since the Belmont. But I, I still need validation. Not validation that Archangelo is a very good horse and is for real, but validation that he can beat these kind of horses twice in a row and, and as the second choice i'm i'm not going to jump on archangelo forte by the way approaching even money doesn't do it for me here i agree he's the horse to beat but he hasn't been beating horses by a lot maybe that happens again in the travers where he he wins because he's the best horse but again approaching even money uh, such good horses in here i'm, I'm going to go with mage i think the kentucky derby winners are a, a little bit forgotten here no better than third choice uh, I, like I said, I like his progression coming up into the Travers. This is the race they pointed for. Mile and a quarter did him well in the Derby. I'm going to try Mage. I think there are other battleable horses with bigger odds in here too. Matt, uh, National Treasure possibly on the lead. Scotland as an up-and-comer. And like we said, we can't throw anybody out. Let me get a parting shot from you before we leave this Travers edition of Horse Center, Matt. Hey, exciting race. Uh the Travers, it, 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 we got the field that we wanted. Can't wait to, uh, to watch it. Uh, and what a card undercard at, uh, Saratoga. Also a great day of racing. I tell you what, Brian, it's going to be a big, big crowd up there on Saturday. They've had some big crowds when I've been there. So if you're going enjoy. Yeah, and don't forget, uh, don't forget about Friday and that personal incident, but yeah, Saturday's race is a big day. Saratoga, for sure, all those races, the Sword Dancer, the Ballerina, uh, the Forgo, the the, the uh, King's Bishop, which I guess is now called the Jerkins Memorial. Big, uh, big day at Saratoga. Enjoy it. Um, we will be back next week. We'll talk about the Travers a little bit. But, uh, of course, we're going to Del Mar next week, Matt, for the Pacific Classic on Horse Center. So don't miss that. As always, I want to thank... Our friend in the home office, Candace Curtis, for the Race Graphics Derby Wars, our sponsor, the best contest site out there in Timeform US for the pace projectors. Most of all, folks, I want to thank you for watching each and every week here on Horse Hunter. Matt and I sincerely appreciate it. Turn on those notifications. Make sure you've subscribed to the Horse Racing Nation channel. 
And we'll see you next week talking Pacific Classic right here on Horse Center.